Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we'll be discussing the history of the magical sporting event known far and wide around the Wizarding World as Quidditch. Intro and Definition of Quidditch Quidditch is without a doubt the most popular and well-known sport played by witches and wizards in the entirety of the Wizarding World. It is, as you may have guessed or probably already know, extremely magical in nature as the whole game revolves around various balls that fly about of their own volition and is played while riding around on broomsticks. With two opposing teams of seven, Quidditch is played on a pitch typically set up on a deserted moor or field, far from the view of us muggles. And just as with many of our non-magical team sports, there are different positions on each team. These positions are known as the chasers, of which there are three, the beaters, of which there are two, a single keeper and a seeker. Quidditch is also played using four different balls, an entirely seamless red leather quaffle, 12 inches in size and used to score points on opposing teams' goals, two 10 inch iron bludges, which only serve to knock players off their broomsticks in their game, and a golden snitch, a small golden ball with silver rotational wings. Both teams then have three goalposts, raised high in the air with a large hoop at the top of each. It's the chaser's job to use the quaffle to score on the opposing team's goals. Each successful shot through one of these hoop goals is worth 10 points. Goal posts are guarded by a team's keeper, similar to that of a muggle sports team's goalie. The beater's primary responsibility is to hit or beat the bludgers away from their teammates in order to allow them to score points uninterrupted without being knocked off of their broomsticks. And then there's the seeker, who basically plays a game all on their own, with their one and only goal being to find and catch the golden snitch before the other team's seeker. Doing so earns the seeker's team 150 points and signifies the end of the match. Of course, as with any sport, Quidditch hasn't always been played this way. It has evolved over the centuries and has a rich and rather colorful past. In fact, we are fortunate enough to have an incredibly robust account of Quidditch's history thanks to Quidditch Through the Ages, a text by the wizard Kenilworthy Wisp. Throughout the remainder of today's video, the information that I'll be sharing is based on Kenilworthy's tremendous research and body of work, all of which focused on the evolution and history of this incredible sport. The use of broomsticks for flying. Before there was Quidditch or any game that used broomsticks for that matter, there had to be the invention of brooms for flight. Taking place many, many centuries ago, this revolutionary way of transportation for the wizarding world is said to have begun as early as AD 962, when witches and wizards went looking for ways to fly, unencumbered by the laws of gravity. After all, they could make objects float about and fly around, so why not people? Why not broomsticks? And so, the witches and wizards of the time got to work and invented a way to make brooms fly with people balanced on top of them. It likely goes without saying that these broomsticks were very much unlike the brooms of today and are known to have been incredibly uncomfortable to fly on with plenty of knots and splinters sticking up along the handle. The Museum of Quidditch, which is located in London, has a medieval broomstick on display, which showcases just how rudimentary these initial modes of transportation were. It is made of unvarnished ash and the end is simply hazel twigs haphazardly bound together. Of course, none of this is much of a surprise due to the time in history and a general lack of industrialized manufacturing. In fact, it's said that the individual families would actually make their own broomstick, leading to each broom being incredibly unique and varying greatly from one another. The use of brooms for entertainment. By the 10th century, however, the practice of flying broomsticks had come a long way and witches and wizards across the globe were using them for entertainment purposes rather than just travel. One of the first known events in which brooms were used for sport and entertainment was a well-known annual Swedish broomstick race that ran over 300 miles from Kopperberg to Arjeplog, directly through a dragon reservation. Also played as early as the 1100s was the ancient German game of Stichstock. Depictions of Stichstock can be seen in the 1105 painting of Gunther the Violent is the Winner, which suggests that a pole of maybe 20 feet or so was topped with an inflated dragon bladder protected by one team on regular brooms, who were tied to the pole with a rope about half the length of the pole. 
The opposing team would then attempt to puncture the bladder using specifically sharpened broomsticks. Around the same time, there was also an Irish game called, I'm gonna butcher this, Eingingen, in which players would carry a ball made of the gallbladder of a goat, called a dom, fly through a row of burning barrels set up on stilts, and attempt to throw the dom through the last barrel without catching fire. Whichever player could complete this task the fastest won, and while that may sound like one of the most dangerous sports one could participate in, Eingingen was nothing compared to, I'm gonna butcher this one as well, Kreatsien, a Scottish game that is considered to be the most dangerous ancient broom sport. Popular throughout the Middle Ages before it was finally made illegal in 1762, the game had players wearing cauldrons on their heads, as they tried to catch as many falling rocks as they could without dying. The rocks used for the sport were typically charmed boulders that would come raining down from a height of at least 100 feet. The following 11th century Gaelic poem describes the danger. The players assembled, twelve fine hearty men. They strapped on their cauldrons, stood poised to fly. At the sound of the horn, they were swiftly airborne, but ten of their number were fated to die. The broomstick sports that followed were incredibly mellow in comparison to Kreatsian, with very few being of note. A few standouts, however, include the English game known as Shunt Bumps, which was essentially jousting on broomsticks, and Swivenhodge, which was similar to Muggle Tennis, with the exception of it being played on broomsticks. In the case of Swivenhodge, players would sit backwards on their brooms and hit an inflated pig's bladder back and forth using the brush end of their broomsticks. Much later in the 18th century, an American game called Quadpot was invented by Abraham Peasgood, a wizard who unintentionally altered the game of Quidditch when he was attempting to bring the game to the United States. But I'm getting ahead of myself, for we have yet to cover the beginnings of the very game we're discussing here in today's video. Which brings us to the beginnings of Quidditch. Quidditch was likely invented in the 11th century, around the same time as many of the other European broom sports that we've just discussed. The first known sightings of Quidditch was by a witch who lived in Quidditch Marsh in the 1000s called Gertie Kettle. Gertie recorded being rather bothered by a nearby broomstick game in her diary, describing what is believed to have been a primitive form of Quidditch including a rudimentary quaffle, bludgers, and gulls. The next account of the game didn't come for another hundred years, when a Yorkshire wizard named Goodwin Neen described the game in a letter he wrote to his Norwegian cousin. Goodwin's description of Quidditch signifies several key things. One, his location in Yorkshire suggests that 100 years after Gertie first saw the game being played in Quidditch Marsh, Quidditch had spread across England. And two, the equipment and game itself had evolved, as Goodwin calls the game itself Quidditch with a K, and also used the terms bludder and catcher, which can presumably be forms of the modern day bludger and chaser. In his letter, Goodwin also makes note of new scoring barrels, and describes there being three at each end of the field, all of which were up on stilts. From later accounts given by various sources, we know that by the 1200s, Quidditch had continued to evolve, with new terminology and additions to the game cropping up like Quaffle, Keepers, Gold Baskets, and Quadditch with a C. One of the biggest changes to the game, however, didn't take place until the middle of the 13th century, when the Golden Snitch was eventually added to the game. Yet before the small bewitched golden ball became an integral part of Quidditch, there was a brief moment in history in which live birds called Snidgets were used instead of the snitch. This rather barbaric practice was inspired by snidget hunting, which was a popular pastime in the early 1100s. Snidget hunting was a rather difficult endeavor, and involved witches and wizards searching for this species by broom. The difficulty of the activity was due to the birds themselves being rather small and agile. Similarly to the Quidditch snitch, the snidget is golden in color and looks like a puffed up ball with wings. The first time a snidget was used in the game of Quidditch was in 1269, when Barbarus Bragg, the chief of the Wizards Council at the time, attended a game in Kent and released one of these birds onto the pitch. For whatever reason, he then told the Quidditch teams that he would give 150 galleons to the player who caught the snidget first. This random decision made by Barbarus led to snidgets being released during every Quidditch game thereafter. The rules of the game were then altered to include a hunter, 
who pursued the Snidget with their one and only goal being to catch and kill the bird in order to end the game and earn their team an additional 150 points. Snidgets were kept on the pitch by repelling spells cast by the crowd as they watched the match. Fortunately for the Snidget, these birds became a protected species by the mid 1300s, when the new chief of the Wizards Council, Elfrida Clagg, outlawed the use of Snidgets in Quidditch matches. In response to the removal of the live birds from the game, a wizard from Godric's Hollow, Bowman Wright, invented the Golden Snitch. A skilled metal charmer, Bowman modeled the walnut sized ball after the Snidget birds, including their unique rotational wings, and bewitched it to stay within the boundaries of the pitch. Around the same time in 1362, the Wizards Council decided to prohibit the playing of Quidditch within 50 miles of any Muggle town or settlement because of a number of sightings of witches and wizards flying around on their broomsticks. Due to a general lack of cooperation, this decree was then amended to 100 miles in 1368. The Birth of Modern Day Quidditch In 1398, Zacharias Mumps was the first wizard to write down and record the rules of the game of Quidditch. These rules also included instructions on how and where witches and wizards should play the game, emphasizing the need for caution around muggles. One of Zacharias' primary recommendations was for those interested in playing Quidditch to set up their game far away from any muggle habitants. He also advised that people play only at night. Clearly, Zacharias' warnings were not heeded, as in 1419, the Wizards Council made another decree that Quidditch should not be played, and I quote, anywhere near any place where there is the slightest chance that a muggle might be watching, or we'll see how well you can play whilst chained to a dungeon wall. Despite the council's warnings, however, adequate anti-muggle security measures were not enforced until the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy went into effect several hundred years later in 1692. It was at this time that Britain created the Department of Magical Games and Sports within the British Ministry of Magic, a department tasked with upholding the statute during wizarding sporting events. During the late 14th century and into the 15th, the game of Quidditch itself continued to evolve. It was noted around this time in the game's history that the pitch was oval in shape and approximately 500 feet long by 180 feet wide. The center of the pitch had a small circle for releasing the balls at the start of each match, and at this time the bludgers were made of carved stone. Similar to modern day Quidditch, each side had seven players and there was a choir judge or referee minding the game. During these formative years, keepers played both goalkeeper and offensive positions, meaning that they could move about the pitch and attempt to score on the opposing team's goals if they wanted to. The first ever Quidditch World Cup was held in 1473 and has been held every four years since then. Despite being called the World Cup, only European teams participated for the first couple hundred years, with the first non-European team joining the tournament in the 17th century. A list of 700 known Quidditch fouls can be found in the records of the Department of Magical Games and Sports, all of which occurred during the final match of the inaugural World Cup in 1473 between Transylvania and Flanders. The Evolution of Modern Day Quidditch As the centuries went by, Quidditch continued to evolve into the game we know and love today. In 1538, a ban on using wands against the opposing team went into effect. Around that same time, due to the magically reinforced bats used by the majority of beaters, bludgers were no longer made of stone but lead, which eventually became iron. By the early 1600s, designated scoring areas had been added to the pitch, which we know from the book The Noble Sport of Warlocks, written by Quintius Umfraville in 1620. Quintius' work also indicates that the scoring baskets had become smaller than they were in the 14th century, and with the introduction of the new designated scoring areas, keepers were advised to play more like traditional goalkeepers and no longer attempt offensive maneuvers. In 1652, the European Cup was established and has been held every three years since then. The later half of the 1600s didn't see much development in the game. In fact, it was not until 1711 that a noteworthy change occurred. This was the year that, due to poor weather conditions, the quaffle officially became scarlet in color. The bright red color was chosen in an effort to help the players keep track of the quaffle when it would fall from play into the ground which had turned incredibly muddy from the vast quantities of rain. 
It's likely rainy games like this that also led to the bewitching of the quaffle to fall slowly to the ground if dropped by a player, an innovation suggested by a witch named Daisy Penifold. The rules recorded by Zacharias Mumps in 1398 were then updated and made official by the Department of Magical Games and Sports upon its establishment in 1750. They are as follows. 1. Though there is no limit imposed on the height to which a player may rise during the game, he or she must not stray over the boundary lines of the pitch. Should a player fly over the boundary, his or her team must surrender the quaffle to the opposing team. 2. The captain of a team may call for timeouts by signaling to the referee. This is the only time players' feet are allowed to touch the ground during a match. Timeout may be extended to a two hour period if a game has lasted more than 12 hours. Failure to return to the pitch after two hours leads to the team's disqualification. 3. The referee may award penalties against the team. The chaser taking the penalty will fly from the central circle towards the scoring area. All players other than the opposing keeper must keep well back while the penalty is taken. 4. The quaffle may be taken from another player's grasp, but under no circumstances must one player seize hold of any part of another player's anatomy. 5. In the case of injury, no substitutions of players will take place. The team will play on without the injured player. 6. Ones may be taken onto the pitch, but must under no circumstances whatsoever be used against opposing team members. Any opposing team member's broom, the referee, any of the balls, or any member of the crowd. 7. A game of Quidditch ends only when the golden snitch has been caught, or by mutual consent of the two team captains. With the general rules and regulations well established by the 18th century, the next evolution in the game focused on the player's primary piece of equipment, their broomsticks. In the early 19th century, players were using day brooms and would place the cushioning charm invented by Elliot Smethwick in 1820 on their broomsticks in order to make them more comfortable to ride. 1901 saw the first ever moon trimmer broom, created by Gladys Boothby, which was in high demand for Quidditch players for quite some time. However, the moon trimmer was eventually replaced in popularity by the silver arrow, which was the first ever true racing broom, reaching up to 70 miles per hour in speed. In 1926, the Clean Sweep Broom Company was founded by Bob, Bill, and Barnaby Ollerton, forming the first company to mass-produce quality broomsticks. The Clean Sweep Broom Company marketed their equipment as a racing broom specifically designed for sporting use. The establishment of quite a few broomstick companies followed soon after, including the Comet Trading Company in 1929, Ellaby and Spudmore in 1940, and Universal Brooms Limited in 1955. A major change-up in the industry then occurred when the Nimbus Racing Broom Company was launched in 1967. The company simultaneously released their first broomstick model that year, the Nimbus 1000, which could reach speeds of up to 100 miles per hour and turn 360 degrees. Throughout the evolution of the Quidditch broomstick, there were also a few changes that took place which affected how the game itself was played. For example, in 1883, scoring baskets were replaced with the hooped goalposts used in modern day Quidditch. This marked the last major alteration to the pitch to have occurred to this day. Then, in 1884, the Department of Magical Games and Sports announced a new rule known as the Stooging Penalty, which only allowed the chaser carrying the quaffle to enter the designated scoring area or a goal would be disallowed. Then, 1875 saw the discovery of gripping charms, which were placed directly on quaffles, eliminating the need for them to have leather handles or finger holes as they once did. The longest Quidditch match in history took place in 1884, when a game went on for six months on Bodmin Moor. The length of the match was due to both seekers failing to capture the golden snitch. After six long months, both teams finally gave up and mutually decided to call the game. Professional Quidditch Leagues Played recreationally and at the school age level, Quidditch is a game for everyone. However, as with most popular muggle sports, there are also a number of professional leagues that participate in matches year-round, many of which are attended by Quidditch fans from all over the world. As Britain is the birthplace of Quidditch, it surely comes as no surprise that there are many professional teams throughout Britain and Ireland. Thirteen, to be exact, they are 
the Appleby Arrows, a Northern English team founded in 1612, the Ballycastle Bats, a Northern Irish team who's won the Quidditch League 27 times, the Carefully Catapults, a Welsh team founded in 1402, the Chudley Cannons, famous for having won the Quidditch League 21 times, but infamous for not having done so since 1892, the Falmouth Falcons, a rough team with a reputation for hard play, the Holyhead Harpies, a female only Welsh team founded in 1203, the Kenmare Kestrels, an Irish team founded in 1291, the Montrose Magpies, the most successful team in the British and Irish League, having won 32 times, they've also claimed the European Championship twice, the Pride of Portree, a team from the Isle of Skye, founded in 1292, the Puddlemere United, the oldest team in the league, founded in 1163, the Tutshill Tornadoes, a team founded in 1520, the Wigtown Wanderers, a team founded by seven siblings in 1422, and the Wimborne Wasps, a team founded in 1312. Other reputable teams in Europe include the Bulgarian Vratza Vultures, the French Quiberon Quaffle Punches, and the Portuguese Braga Broomfleet. Worldwide, there are also many other teams, including the New Zealand Mutohora Macaws, the Ugandan Patonga Proudsticks, and the Canadian Stonewall Stormers. And with that, we've come to the end of another video. What did you think? What did I miss? Please share your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. Who or what should I cover the history of next? Also, be sure to check out the content on Spotify, as well as extra content on my second channel, Harry Potter Theory Extra. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.